Ah, the beauty of thy peace. Mm. And when I think of peace, I think of our speaker, mm -hmm. one of those quiet luminaries who has totally embodied and embraced the science of mind as a philosophy. And he expresses it so eloquently. Friends, I ask you to put your hands together and welcome to the podium practitioner, Vance Gardner. Good morning, Temple family. And thanks, Sandy, for that wonderful welcome. I'll do my best to embody what you have said. If we are one big happy family, no one would have to beg to eat. If we lived in a world of dignity, no man would have to live on the street. If I tell you you are a part of me, there is no need for disbelief. Here is my hand to let you know that what we dream we all can hold. Apart we are weak, together we are strong. O oh, people, we are writing this song. We are living these words together forever. There's no reason we can't live and be one. Build the world that we want together. For as you stand, for as long as you stand here by me, we'll live on. Good morning, friends, again. As I was listening to Patti LaBelle's fantastic voice singing, I wondered how many people really listen to the lyrics of music, the words of sage and prophets. Do we really listen to each other? And do we really, importantly, listen to ourselves? Paul Tillich, a Christian existentialist philosopher, and who is widely regarded as one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century said, the first duty of love is to listen. But do we really listen or do we just hear? To really listen, we have to practice active listening. Active listening is different from normal listening we do in everyday conversations. Instead of just waiting to talk or thinking about what we are going to say, once our conversation partner stops speaking, active listening requires that the listener completely focus on absorbing, comprehending, and reflecting what the speaker is saying. Active listening is to feel empathy which is easy to say, but challenging to practice. When you are active listening, be mindful to think about how you would feel if you were in the other person's shoes. Ask yourself, what would I be feeling, doing, sensing if I were them? By making the effort to empathize, your response to the other person will naturally give off the compassion and the need to feel better. However, don't sympathize. Sympathy instead involves feeling sorry for the other person and ourselves in similar circumstances. Sympathizing involves becoming a wound mate that is, enter into the emotional state of the speaker. When somebody is telling you their sad story, you respond with one of your own, and then both of you relive the negative experiences together, which will help neither. Be compassionate but unattached. To be a healing presence, 
like the master teacher showed with the raising of Lazarus. Briefly, for anyone who doesn't know or remember the story from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 to 44, briefly, the master teacher was told that his friend, Lazarus, was very ill and needed him. Yahshua, a.k.a. Jesus of Nazareth, eventually went to his friend home. Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, told him that he was four days late and Lazarus had died. Jesus wept. He then recognized that this was his moment to be a revealer of the truth that life is eternal and by the practice of faith and true understanding he could speak his word into being. He didn't allow his consciousness to be lowered as we Jamaicans tend to say to be dragged down by listening to the mourners who told him he was too late and that Lazarus is dead and nothing could be done. We all know the end of the story. Jesus went and told them to remove the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And that was his great demonstration to raise Lazarus from the seemingly dead. Earlier this year, I became a listener on Seven, Cup, an, Seven Cups, an online therapy provider. It allows for persons to connect and chat by text with listeners for all kinds of reasons, from the big existential thoughts to the small day-to-day -day things that we all experience. Seven Cups listeners don't judge or try to solve problems or tell people what to do. We just listen. We understand and give the space you need to clear your head and become aware of your thoughts and feelings. Like Sons of Mind practitioner, listening involves paraphrasing for clarity and understanding uplifting questions to aid empowerment and greater self-awareness and the full attention to absorb what is unfolding. I'm not allowed to offer prayer support, but the members can request that in the chat. It is in my profile that I'm a Sands of Mind practitioner. I have learned, I have learned and truly believe that most of the issues we face in the world and in our personal lives can be resolved if we practice to actively listen to each other and listen to ourselves. As Marvin Gaye sings, we got to find a way to bring some understanding here today. So as the song say, what's going on because war is not the answer. The awakening of our faculty of understanding starts with questioning. Questioning the old ways of thinking that we may have taken for granted. Spiritual understanding is the quickening of the spirit within, our awakening to our spiritual magnificence by listening to and trusting divine guidance as our inspirational reading told us this morning. Spiritual understanding is raising our consciousness through spiritual practices that develop ears that hear. In Matthew 13 verses 3 to 9, Jesus said, A sower went forth to sow his seed, his seeds. And as he sowed them, some fell along the hard pathway where many people had walked and packed down the soil. Since the seed could not take root, they were exposed on the top of the soil, and the birds would come along and 
eat them up. Some fell on rocky ground. The topsoil was loose enough for the Swede to take root, but they had no depth. Then some of the seeds fell among thorns. As they tried to grow, they were choked out by the thorns. Finally, some seeds fell on good ground and produced some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some hundredfold. He concludes by saying, whoever, have, whoever has ears, let them hear. I am saying the same thing this morning. Now, Reverend Laura Fleming of the Unity of Phoenix Spiritual Center explains that the soil represents our consciousness. We may have a little of each type. It may also be that we have overcome some of each type. Jesus was teaching that our conscious mind, the one we use every day, is superimposed over a deeper divine mind. We have both. We use it all the time, even when we are not aware of it, many times unconsciously. If we can recognize divine mind, we can allow divine ideas, like the seeds in the parable, to begin to grow in our consciousness. When we close our minds and hearts to the truth that we have the Spirit of God within us, we have ears that do not hear. Then the parable has no meaning for us. But when we are open to the truth, we, let, we get past the rules and the dogma, those man-made rules. We have come to internalize. And when we get past that, we can enter into the inner kingdom of heaven, that realm of higher consciousness and oneness. It is important that we take our spirituality, our divine nature, into our everyday experience represented by the seeds. When we step into the world, we take with us a multitude of internalized thoughts, attitudes, and old beliefs and values. But we can choose to see the spiritual in every material experience. That rocky ground may be our lack of commitment to our own spiritual development that robs us of our true potential. Even our best intentions represented by those seeds, can be choked out by our lack of understanding or ability to have ears that hear. All seeds grown in higher consciousness produce good fruit of joy, prosperity, peace, love, and abundance. 100 fold or more. We create a world that is centered in spiritual consciousness in the realm of God within when we pray and when we meditate. And if we are one with our Christ's nature, we already know that this is true. Oh, because then we have ears that hear. The key to the understanding of this parable is this. There is a divine mind, universal and unconditional. It is our connection to spirit where we access divine ideas. And then there is a conscious phase of mind which is individual, personal, and localized, as one of my practitioner friends always tend to remind me. We all have it. This is our unique 
and individual mind. Together, divine mind and our mind are one in all and all in one. Spirit is our eternal identity. As individuals, we all have relationships with spirit. The four types of conditions of soil and the rock represent four types of human response and understanding to spirit within. When we hear the word of the kingdom and do not understand it, it cannot take root and grow in our hearts. And that is like the seed that is sown on the path. This may be like when I first started to come to this Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living, and I got the urge to tithe. But based upon what I've been taught and experiences the challenges of meeting bills and financial obligations of the time, I didn't understand it. And the birds of meeting day-to-day -day expenses took it away. However, after doing 40 prosperity course with Reverend John, it raised my consciousness. And through demonstration, I co I've come to realize that spirit is my all sufficiency. And that the more we give, the more we receive. Then there are times when we hear the word and immediately receive it with joy. Yet our relationship with God within wasn't very deep. And when trouble arose, that relationship, so, that relationship suffered because it was sown on rocky ground. This is like when we get a divine idea and it is reinforced by an encouragement from a minister or a practitioner at one of our services. You get excited about it. But then you are challenged by circumstances and even others, and you lose interest and revert to the old ways of thinking and doing things which have become rocks in your awareness. Then we hear the word, but the cares of the world, the lure of wealth, and lack of control over our eager tendencies and impulses are like the weeds which choke them out. We may even yield to the temptation to use our understanding for mesmeric, mesmeric, mesmeric purposes to further our own presidential, sorry, I mean personal ambitions, <laughs> and we can point out the examples, the well-known examples, but more challenging is to recognize the times we too have failed to control our own egos and have edged God out of our awareness. But when we hear the word with a consciousness of oneness, and spiritual understanding is like the seed sown on good soil and it bears fruit 100 fold because we are truly living in the kingdom of heaven where we experience heaven on earth. In this day and age, we have our thoughts and feelings challenged every day. We are bombarded by the radio, television, books, and newspaper with all types and kinds of ideas. Most of them are negative. The Apostle Paul gave us some good advice for developing this consciousness when he said, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think from the consciousness 
of having these things. That is my elaboration on what Paul actually said. It would be greater and more advantageous if the newspaper would write about and tell about the many good things that go on. There are things being done in this world that most people know little or nothing about. And for Lent, we could try to follow Emmett Fox's suggestion of trying to go at least seven days without thinking negatives. <laughs> but more importantly, the master asks us to spend time in the silence, to listen with ears that hear to our divine guidance. Now, silence is not the absence of sound. Silence is referring to an absence of ego concerns, an absence of world thought. That's the silence. And you can do that while you are walking or driving or eating or whatever. This is what we must learn, an absence of ego concerns, an absence of a material sense of self. An absence of that world thought, thoughts about the world. When you have that absence of ego concern, you will have attained the silence. And into that silence, into that inner recept receptivity that you have created by an absence of the liquor self, into that silence will flow a conscious awareness of God, and it will show you a new heaven and a new earth. You don't even have to ask for it. Joel Goldsmith in Leave Your Nets, that's a class that we do on Thursday evenings from 7 to 9 with Reverend Ann and Reverend Sonia. It's a class well worth attending. <coughs> Sorry, Joel Goldsmith tells us, as we come into the realization of the true nature of our being, and the true nature of God's being as individual being, in that proportion, we have risen above the circumstances and conditions of human existence. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. At first, this may leave us floating through space and wondering where we are going to land. <coughs> Sorry. Before we discover what this power of the invisible is that acts upon our lives and transforms our consciousness. Excuse me. Um, yeah, and transforms our consciousness. The power of the invisible is that it acts upon our lives and transforms our consciousness. My addendum, <coughs> sorry, my addendum to the same, it transforms our lives to where right action is our only choice, and to be the peace that passes all human understanding. So at this time, I'm inviting you now to put away all concerns, to relax and center yourselves. In the 
silence there is unspoken joy in the silence there's release from a world full of chaos and noise so It's refreshing in the silence. Those online <clears throat> would see on your screen a tweet from Stephen Bartlett which said, which says, you can read as many books as you like, but if you are unable to read yourself, you will never learn a thing. Those of us who are unfamiliar with British influencers and celebrities may not have heard about Stephen Bartlett. He has written a best-selling book, Happy Sexy Millionaire, among many other accomplishments. But here is what he wrote that inspired that tweet. As an 18-year-old, black, broke, lonely, insecure university dropout from a bankrupt family, I wrote in my diary that I wanted to be a happy, sexy millionaire by the age of 25. By the age of 25, I was a multimillionaire, 
having created a business worth over $300 million. US dollars we're talking about. Ironically, in achieving everything I set out to, I learned that I was wrong. About almost everything. The world had lied to me. It lied to me about how to attain fulfillment, love, and success, and why those things mattered, and what those words actually mean. We are losing ourselves. We are chasing the wrong things, asking the wrong questions, and polluting our minds. It's time to stop. It's time to resist and it's time to rethink the fundamental social blueprint that our lives are built upon. And for those of you who don't know, he is one of the presenters on a popular BBC program called The Dragons Den. He's the only black member of The Dragons Den. And he's the youngest member of The Dragons Den because he's not yet 30 years old. He said his purpose is to help young people from less privileged backgrounds like his, especially minorities who don't always see themselves reflected in certain programs or industries, to feel enabled. And he wants to provide the resources and the tools like learning how to use social media effectively to monetize their invention. As he wrote to complete the quote, if you never apply the wisdom you have learned, you will never grow. So friends, it is as David Archuleta sings. It's like a symphony. Just keep listening. And pretty soon you'll start to figure out your part. Everyone has a piece and there are melodies in each of us. And soon you will know how to let it ring out as you discover who you truly are. Others around you will start to wake up to the sounds that are in their hearts. Friends, it is so amazing what we are all creating. It is truly glorious. Namaste. Awesome. I mean, the first duty of love is to listen. How much do we use this wonderful gift? And Vance invited us to practice active listening, to empathize, to be compassionate, but not, um, not sympathetic. Right? To be empathetic, to be a healing presence to others. We need to develop the, the practice of paraphrasing, to be able to ask strong, powerful questions for clarity, to allow the other person to express and to hear and to understand them. Um, and my words, when, you, when, when somebody gets that you get them, it makes a world of difference to the quality of the relationship. He says, part of our, uh, our awakening is spiritual understanding, to raise our consciousness with ears that hear to let our divine mind always be open to the truth, to get past the noise of the world, to get past judgment, to know that spirit is our eternal destiny. He shared the wonderful parable of the sower and the seeds and looked at the different levels of consciousness. And maybe the question is, what level can you identify in terms of, of how you hear, on, um, how you hear, um, understand, and express the truth? So we have work to do, mm -hmm. and we need to do that work, oftentimes in the silence, to, to, for us to find a quiet time to allow the voice of spirit to speak and express through us. Because with, those, with the ears of an open consciousness, we shall truly hear. Thank you again, Vance. Let us just give him another round of applause.